speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Crum, who is Associate Professor in Victoria University School of Educational Psychology and Pedagogy, um, who will have a particular interest in how people learn to read and can talk to read. Uh, he's going to be discussing how we form and modify our beliefs in response to new information, although personally I'm planning to disregard anything he says that contradicts my own conceptions. Uh, please welcome the Dr. Matt Crow. Thank you, and also I'd like to thank the Skeptic Society for inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, you see the title of the talk is Evaluation of Belief Relevant Information. That's pretty much how you think about information that is consistent or inconsistent with person belief. So, uh, to make this a little more concrete, I'm going to put up an example here. And, um, get people to think through it and we'll talk about what that means later. Think about what the research has to say about that. So the first thing, um, earlier you've been talking, you've heard people talking about climate change. I don't know anything about climate change, it has to be a topic, it's timely. Um, but uh, read through this. So the statement is, I believe that global climate change is occurring. And then what you're tasked here to do is to rate the strength of your agreement with this statement. So one, very strongly disagree. The other end, you've got nine very strongly agree. And then think about why you have that response. Okay. Everybody figure out where they're at right there. Next, what I'm going to do is show you some evidence about whether or not climate change is occurring. First one global sea level rose about 17 centimeters in the last century. The rate in the last decade, however, has nearly doubled that in the last century. This evidence demonstrates that climate change is occurring. I'd like you to rate the strength of this argument. And once you've done that, most of you are sitting next to somebody. Share with them your number and explain why you rated it that way.
extent to the strength of the argument and the evidence. Generally speaking, this is what you'd see. So, on the here, yes, climate change is occurring. No, climate change is not occurring. On this side, that's that 0 to 7, and that's argument strength. So, the CO2 <coughs> argument, if you look at that, if you think that climate change is occurring, you probably rate it really that one as low, generally speaking. But if you don't think that climate change is occurring, then you probably rate that one high level, and vice versa. So look at that blue one, the sea level. If you believe that climate change is occurring, you probably rate that one quite strong. If you don't think it's occurring, you probably rate it weakly, and not quite as strong. Those are some general predictions that you don't have to you know, say out loud right now. So, how many of you have your patterns reflect this? Okay. So that kind of goes back to what Elf was saying, that do, when we pre present information, <coughs> does that really change people's beliefs? So the topic that I'm looking at with this uh, current line of research that I'm developing is how do people's beliefs influence how they evaluate information that's both compatible and incompatible with their beliefs? This is something that's referred to as hot cognition. Cold cognition, essentially, is uh, just learn some information, learn some facts, and don't challenge your core beliefs. So people don't typically resist information that doesn't challenge their beliefs. However, when they are being asked to learn to evaluate information that does challenge their core beliefs, core beliefs, then they tend to resist that. And that can be problematic, and other times it's actually justified, it's not problematic. Okay, so uh, historically, um, what people will do in this line of research is give people, uh, rate their attitudes before, so you've done that, then give them evidence or scenarios that have information that they'll challenge or compatible with people's beliefs, and then they have them rate the information. This uh, last 30 years, we find that people tend to rate belief consistent data as more valid stronger and more persuasive. Now keep in mind, they're, they're looking at the same information, they just hold different beliefs. And when people are reading this information, when they read inconsistent messages, they tend to make reputational comments, try and undermine and discredit that information. The flip side of that is, when individuals read belief consistent messages, they tend to make supportive comments. I agree with that, and here's why. Okay. This is what you, we typically find. And people who are in the social psych area have come to the term called motivated reasoning. And that is defined as situations in which an individual seeks to confirm a preferred conclusion. So when you're presented information, you're already going in with a directional goal. You're wanting to confirm what you already believe. But there's two different types of this. The first one is belief-motivated reasoning. And the second one is knowledge-motivated reasoning. And I'll unpack both of those next. So the process here with belief-motivated reasoning is that people receive belief inconsistent evidence. And they perceive that as a threat. As a result, this third step there is they seek to disconfirm that evidence. And what happens is they reject that on the basis of the fact that it's incompatible or inconsistent with their beliefs or potentially with their knowledge. So it has nothing to do with the quality of information. It's based on whether or not the information is consistent or compatible with their beliefs. Okay, what are predictors of belief-motivated reasoning? Essentially when people feel threatened. The first type here, um, core values, when core values are threatened. Um, I do have slides that actually have them for the references so people can go with the information themselves and like to review them. And for the example I have up here for Feinberg, this one specifically deals with climate change. What, uh, when we talk about core values, an example of a core value or a core belief uh, that we looked at in this study is that the world is just, that Good things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. So the world is just. 
Well, if climate change is happening, and you tell me there are dire consequences to uh, climate change occurring, but I view the world as being just, then there's a conflict there. I'm a good person. Why are these problems out there? The world will correct itself. Everything will be okay. Conversely, if people don't have very strong, just beliefs, they're more willing to accept the idea that there are some problems out there. So how a message is framed to people who have very strong world beliefs influences their willingness to do something about it. So if, you, if someone has a very strong belief the world is just, and you give them a dire message, that creates too much discomfort, too much threat is uh, felt. As a result, they reject the message, don't want to think about it. But to bring that barrier down is frame it in a positive way. Here's what you can do. It's not this, uh, uh, the earth going to come to an end next, set, next decade. It's how, what can I do about it now? Because you're a good person, good people do these things. Right? Uh, the second type there is when people fear they're going to die. Um, now, this Landau study, in particular, it's an experimental design, and they're just trying to demonstrate an idea. Well, they essentially had people do. Imagine there's two groups of people. One group of persons, um, asked to imagine that they're dead and what happens to their body after they die. What that does is create something called mortality salience, that, that your death is apparent. Okay? Whereas other people didn't have the information. Then they expose them to information about 9 11. These are students in the US. And then they gave them a message, uh, policy implication from George Bush that typically dealt with how to deal with terrorism and invading Iraq and weapons of mass destruction and that nature. The people who thought about their own death in advance were more willing to accept policy, or policy decisions that George Bush made. So that is, if you are scared, you're more willing to accept what he says. So that's why it's quite common that you, know, that you hear politicians always include things like 9-11, 9-11, 9-11, when they're on the trail, because they know that that makes people feel scared. When people feel, feel scared, they're more compliant with you. Okay. You can use that to your advantage as well, I suppose. Uh, in thinking about what's happening recently with um, New Zealand, I didn't notice I saw an interview two weeks ago with John Key talking, you know, trying to get the, um, the spy bill passed. And he was talking about, just so people know, there are members of Al-Qaeda in New Zealand right now. <laughs> so I was wondering if he was really doing this mortality standards and the uh, people associate Al Qaeda with, with death and whether they extended that far. I'm not sure. Uh, the last one here that I wanted to touch upon was uh, when a source is not perceived as credible or trustworthy. And this great Meyer uh, study, uh, what they did is they gave people the same messages but they changed who said it. So was it from a political party they affiliated with or not? When they hid the political party, then they evaluated the information differently than when it was labeled as coming from a particular source who was used as credible and was a part of their um, political party. That was studies connected in Germany. Okay, so in this uh, general idea, uh, belief motivated reasoning is when people feel threatened or they're given unfamiliar information, they retreat back and their goal is to protect that belief and maybe less receptive information as a result of that. The second type, which everybody up here, I'm sure, is your skeptics, is the idea of knowledge motivated reasoning. And knowledge motivated reasoning, how they, the main way they differ is that someone who is, has not demonstrated knowledge motivated reasoning they apply the same standard of evaluation to information as compatible and incompatible with their beliefs. Whereas, so we said that people who are doing belief motivated, motivated reasoning are applying a different standard in common terms of the, they're being hypocritical. They're, being, they're scrutinizing information that's challenging their beliefs, but they're not applying the same standard to what um, they do believe. So knowledge motivated reasoning. Um, you know, we start on the left-hand side, um, moving to the right, 
present somebody with belief in consistent evidence. And rather than feeling a threat, the person detects a discrepancy. That's not what I think. But they don't feel threatened. So I'll scrutinize that evidence, and I might reject that based on the quality of the evidence, not because it makes me feel uncomfortable. So just because you reject something does not make you inherently biased. It's the manner in which you go about rejecting information. So if you the, essentially, it's not holding a belief, it's not holding a position. It's how do you justify that position or that belief. And when you get information that challenges that and you um, uh, reject it or potentially accept it, it's based on the quality of information, not on some other criteria such as I'll just make you feel uncomfortable. So predictors of knowledge, knowledge and motivated reasoning. The first one is a learning-oriented environment, and that is where people feel okay being dumb, essentially. So that when, you, when people can say what they actually think, usually when they're among their peers, they can have their ideas exposed for, and there could be gaps. If there's gaps in my thinking, that's okay. It's not a problem if I don't understand this. Learning. The learning to take place oftentimes means that you're going from, let's say, a very simple way of characterizing you go from A to B. A is I don't know something, B is I do know something. And if learning is framed that way, I'm not familiar with this. And so you might struggle initially to get to B. That's okay, that's all right. When you have that type of environment in a classroom or in an uh, outreach community uh, setting, that you're more likely to have people feel less threatened when they're given that information. Uh, next one is a disposition to be fair-minded rather than self-serving in the use of evidence. So a term, you know, jargon for that would be metacognitive. You're aware that you hold biases, potentially. And you're aware of your beliefs are. And you try to let your beliefs dictate how you evaluate information. And the, ability, the last one here is the ability to reflect on your own subjectivity. Meaning that I might think this is true, but there's no truth out there with a the capital T that I can know. I'm just a human. But some truths seem to be, some arguments, some evidence seems stronger than other evidence. So I can have a view and support that view, but I have to be open to the fact that I could be wrong. But for right now, I think I'm pretty, I'm, I'm right 90% possibly I'm wrong. Okay, so how do we put these ideas into practice? So this um, relates somewhat to what Elf was talking about, because he and I had, had a brief correspondence before uh, the conference. And so I was trying to find some things, well, what could a person do to promote this motivated reason, or at least to bring down some barriers that people have there um, to threat? So uh, the first one there is, Emphasize the difference between knowledge and beliefs. So knowledge is a uh, person's understanding of the idea, whereas beliefs is the truth value associated with that. Let me give you an example. A person might say, I understand that natural selection explains diversity of life on Earth in the context of evolution. However, I don't believe that is the explanation. So there's the understanding and there's the belief. Or a person might say, I do believe that to be an accurate explanation for the person who lies life on earth. So making a distinction between beliefs and knowledge. Okay, in school settings, I mean, when I'm thinking about what's happening in museum schools now, I'm just reading the newspapers in the last about five weeks or so, talking about religion in schools and evolution. Well, when it comes to religion in schools, one thing that seems to sort of be missing from the messages in the context of academic freedom is that irregardless of whether or not you believe this, experts who have, are responsible for determining the curriculum in biology have established that for you to be knowledgeable about science in general, evolution in particular, you have to understand this key idea. You don't have to accept it, but you have to understand it. And that's one thing I don't think is emphasized, that people think that they have to believe something just because they presented that. A um, big thing here is to provide valid evidence. But as I'm sure you've all experienced, is that just giving people evidence is not enough. Okay. It's uh, related to that's how you frame this. But if you don't have the evidence, then you're going to be um, somewhere in a certain way. Uh, 
frame the message in a way that affirms rather than threatens values. Okay, so if you want people to take care of the environment, say, uh, if somebody has a strong belief in being a Kiwi or an Aussie, say, you frame it along the lines of, this is, this is what good New Zealand leaders do. You're a good New Zealander, right? You should do this. Something along those lines. So you frame it in a way that affirms a person's values rather than threatens their values. And um, the last one here is Daniel Kahan, who's a professor at Yale. Uh, he's looked at how you reference experts who share the values of method recipients. So if you have a spokesperson for a group that those people affiliate with, you're more likely to have them listen to the message because it's coming from a source that they need to be credible. So I, the references are there, so I, I'm assuming that um, the information will be made available through the skeptics. If not, I'm more than happy to send these uh, slides or even just the references to people in general. Uh, so the take home message is that you can engage in essentially two different types of reasoning. If you're aware that you have two different, different types of reasoning exists, aim to focus on the knowledge of the reason, apply the same standard of evaluation. Well, I think that 
always comes to mind looking at this is just how hard it is to sort out the variety of biases that go into how people react to things. And with climate change, I, I have to worry that getting at all of the underlying biases is, is something that's really going to require putting people in hermetically sealed rooms with pure white walls. We, we, we find, for instance, in trying to understand when do people uh, bear witness to crimes. If, if they've recently heard about uh, loyalty on the news, there's no way that they're going to uh, squeal. But if there's been recently a lot of stories on fairness, then they will. And these kinds of bias, it, you can cause a woman to uh, do two grades lower on a mathematics exam simply by looking her from the eyes down to the waist and back up again in a way that has actually been quantified, which I think disturbs me more than anything else. <laughs> um, how do you correct for things like there is a cold room versus a hot room? And things that subtle that can weigh in on climate change. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, just a brief comment about your questions. I was instantly put off by the term climate change. By the climate um, excuse me, uh, I believe I was clear this morning that comments uh, are, are not to be held Do during the Q&A. If you have a question, feel free to ask it. Do you think uh, it would help to call it uh, what, what the usual term is, human, human caused global warming? Uh, potentially, I'm not familiar with the area that much, so when I think of global warming, um, I guess I think about things that I've read talk about climate change, like climate is changing. Just said uh, it's adaptive to hold on to your beliefs. What is the evidence for that, please? Uh, do you have belief that this is really your lifetime? Do you have belief that persists over your lifetime over a certain amount of time? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hi there. I just had a question around confirmation bias in children. And have you done any research as to you know, the likelihood of them changing their minds or you know, after a certain age or the level of confirmation? What I've been doing with kids is uh, physics <coughs> and biology. And generally, what I find it is that when I do not challenge core beliefs, they are willing to modify their conceptual understanding. Um, okay, I think that covers it. Uh, thanks very much.